For many people living with lung cancer, palliative care can be a beacon of hope and support. I'm Diane Mulligan. And I'm Mitch Jelnicker. The goal of palliative care is to alleviate suffering and to nurture, comfort, and promote understanding at every turn. Palliative care is really focused on patient-centric things and how do we help make you feel the best for the longest uh, as you're going through critical illness care. Most insurance plans cover it and it is designed to provide comfort and relief for the patient. So for many living with lung cancer, palliative care is really worthy of exploring. I just cannot stress the importance of having palliative care. Somebody in the palliative care team to help you through this. Lung cancer is a tough topic. It's a disease that affects patients, families, friends, co-workers. But first, it's a disease that affects people. Advances in lung cancer treatments over the last few years have made it possible to live with lung cancer for years after diagnosis. The Hope With Answers Living With Lung Cancer podcast brings you stories about people living, truly living with lung cancer the researchers dedicated to finding new breakthrough treatments, and others who are working to bring hope into the lung cancer experience. Welcome to another edition of Lung Cancer Foundation of America's Hope With Answers podcast. Today, we're going to delve into palliative care and its profound impact on the quality of life for those navigating living with lung cancer. You know, this is a holistic and a compassionate form of care designed to alleviate all types of suffering, whether or not it's associated with lung cancer treatment. Think of it as a team of medical professionals who are focusing on providing relief for symptoms, pain, and stress. So we'll begin with Dr. Sherry Cervantes. She's the Director of Palliative Oncology at the University of Texas Health San Antonio MD Anderson Cancer Center. Dr. Cervantes, how do you define palliative care? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think a lot of people are confused about what palliative care is and what it means. Um, for, for my patients, I really try to express to them that palliative care is about making you be as functional as possible for as long as possible. Um, and we really focus on symptom support and control. We focus on what's valuable to a patient, you know, what, what gives them meaning and drive and motivates them. And we try to incorporate those things into their medical management and plan. So palliative care is really focused on patient centric things and how do we help make you feel the best for the longest uh, as you're going through critical illness care. You know, about quality of life, essentially. So sometimes when people hear the, the word palliative care, they confuse it with hospice care, but they're not really the same, are they? Right. So, so they're actually um, sort of an overlap between palliative care and hospice care, but they're definitely distinct entities. OK, um, most palliative care physicians uh, now go through a training, a fellowship program, um, and part of that training uh, teaches us how to both care for people um, as they're diagnosed with critical illness. So how do we take care of their symptoms? How do we help uh, learn about them and prioritize their goals um, through the end of life? And so a small portion of palliative care is hospice care, um, but hospice care is not all that palliative care is. Uh, so palliative care can be any time uh, throughout the duration of an illness, whereas hospice care is usually closer to the end of life. Let me make sure that I've got this right. I wanna know who exactly should be considering palliative care and when, but is it, is it more of a life limiting illness? Is it, is it impact when, you're, when your illness is impacting the quality of your life? Is that, is that how we should think about it? Yeah, so, so it's both is, is what I would say to that question. And um, one of the, the key things for palliative care services are that the anticipated course of an illness would be life limiting, okay? Um, because oftentimes those have a lot of psychosocial distress or symptom burden associated with them. Uh, and that's what we focus on. That's what a palliative care uh, team would, would help uh, care for. Um, whereas, 
you know, the, the functionality and the quality of life is one of our goals, one of our priorities. Um, patients that have maybe chronic illnesses that may not be life limiting wouldn't be the ideal patient to receive palliative care services. Um, so we, we certainly focus on that for, for patients who have these critical illnesses. Um, but, you know, there, there's only so much that we have the capacity to do in, in palliative care. And, and there's a lot of patients with these illnesses that, that we try to help support. So I want to follow up. So if you have someone who has lung cancer, would you most likely be thinking of people who are at stage four or does it more, is it more impacted by the symptoms that they're having? Yeah, so another great question. And I think this is where a lot of people get confused about palliative care. So even in early stage cancers, there's a potential that that could be a life limiting illness. Okay. Um, and so patients that come in with high symptom burden, so specifically for lung cancers, maybe they have an airway obstruction or something like that, and they're short of breath or they're having chest pain. Those would be patients that are appropriate to see palliative care, even if they're planning to undergo curative treatment. So surgery or radiation and chemotherapy. Um, those are patients we can still assist with and help with. And it may not be that we follow you indefinitely, you might graduate from palliative care services once you complete your treatment. So, you know, I, I, there, there's sort of a spectrum to what we do, but especially in cancer care, um, the earlier, the better, I think. Um, and the more symptoms you have, the more helpful we can be uh, through, you know, your treatment course and, and helping you be successful in that treatment course. It, it sounds like palliative care would offer great comfort to the patient. So, how does it work exactly? Yeah, so with palliative care, oftentimes we're notified by the oncologist or if a patient is hospitalized by maybe the nurse um, that, a, that a patient would be appropriate for us to see. Um, the most common way people are referred to palliative care services would be on an inpatient basis. So you're hospitalized for some reason, um, you're hospitalized to... Um, provide symptom relief, or you're needing to have a surgery, um, potentially you're being diagnosed with your cancer, uh, and palliative care would be called in by your team to, to come and help with manage symptoms, okay? Um, occasionally, there are um, outpatient structures for palliative care medicine, uh, and that is growing, so more and more systems have outpatient or ambulatory palliative care services, uh, and so now oncologists can refer directly. Um, the other way that sometimes people get engaged with palliative care services is they have a family member or, you know, they have a personal experience uh, with palliative care services. And so once they find out about their diagnosis, they ask their physician, hey, I'd, I'd really like to, you know, see palliative care. I think it would be helpful for me. This is fascinating. Do you have like stages in pal palliative care? So I, sort of a, a, a difficult question. We don't formally say that there are stages for palliative care, um, but we try to meet patients wherever they are, okay? So on the inpatient side, palliative care can be involved as a consultative services. There are some hospital systems that actually have inpatient units for palliative care. Uh, and so you might you know, see, consider that as like a phase or a stage. Um, the outpatient setting, there's both clinic-based palliative care services as well as home-based palliative care services. Uh, so there again, just trying to meet patients where they are, how can we be you know, the most useful and, and helpful uh, to patients and their families? Um, and then you know, the, that last portion or, or sort of the next phase of palliative care is really that transition to, to hospice, okay? Um, again, it's included in our palliative care training. It, it, it's considered palliative care in, in a sense, uh, but it's really reserved more for people who we think are closer to the end of life. You mentioned at-home services, also uh, outpatient services. What? Give me an example of the kinds of services that might be included with palliative care. So most palliative care programs are designed to be an interdisciplinary team. So it's not just you walk in and you meet with, with the physician. 
um, the, the hope and, and the design of palliative care is to be able to care for the whole person in, in one place. Uh, and so you'll have access to the social worker, the chaplain, the nurse, uh, sometimes physical therapy or occupational therapy. Uh, most of the time, some type of psychosocial support with a psychologist or psychiatrist. Uh, so we're really trying to care for the whole person all at the same time. It's a team-based approach. Um, so, you know, the expectation when, when you come to meet with us is that we're going to be there for you to listen to what's going on, uh, to try and really get to know you, to try and really get to know your family, and how does that impact your care, your care choices or your decisions that you might be making. So are all palliative care services basically the same? I mean, what questions should you ask and um, what should you be pre prepared for when you have your first consultation? So I would say most often people come into the palliative care office, especially if they're referred from their oncologist, and they really don't have an understanding of why, why they're there. Okay. Um, you ask, you know, what do you know? Um, why, why did your oncologist, why did your cancer doctor send you over to see us? And they go, I don't know. Uh, and, and there's sort of this pause. And, and so um, we, we will commonly go, well, that's okay. Most people don't really know what palliative care is and, and, you know, how we can help. So let me describe a little bit for you and, and talk to you about how we might be able to assist you as you're going through your cancer care. Um, and, and so we talk a little bit about what, resources are available to them as far as our team members. Um, so we do an introduction. So you should anticipate that you're going to meet the team. Okay. Um, we also do sort of a full assessment of what is your symptom? Um, you know, what are other symptoms that you might have? What are your worries or concerns? Um, what questions do you have? What's your understanding of your illness or your treatment? Um, and, and really try to, to learn more about them. Okay, um, so typically you can anticipate that these appointments are longer. Um, most of the time, you know, the first time you meet one of your doctors, it's maybe a 20 to 30 minute visit, um, if, if, if that. Uh, for our new patients, um, most commonly, um, they're somewhere around 45 minutes to an hour and a half. Um, mm -hmm. So they're, they're pretty long visits, and, and that's because we need to get to know you uh, to be able to help care for you uh, moving forward. Yeah, so prepare for some time, and, and that you need to take the time so you get to know the team, and they get to know you and what you're what you're going through. So, can you seek as a patient? Can you seek out palliative care on your own, or must it be recommended by a doctor? No, absolutely. Uh, you can be referred by anybody, including self referral. Um, okay. So we we certainly encourage that, uh, especially for our lung cancer patients. Um, we, we know that palliative care can, can be very impactful in, in lung cancer diagnosis, almost as impactful as a treatment line. Um, you know, the initial, you know, palliative care study that, that really brought palliative care to the forefront, especially in, in cancer patients, was the TEML study. Um, and, and in that study, they looked at patients who were diagnosed with advanced stage lung cancer, um, who received early palliative care, so at the time of their diagnosis, uh, versus patients who received standard oncologic care. Uh, and there was a three month improvement in overall survival. That's as good as a line of chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's really impressive. And, and one of the reasons why we encourage people, you know, if, if you find out that you have a cancer diagnosis and you wanna to talk to us, let your doctor know, tell them you wanna go see palliative care um, and, and we're happy to see you. That's great. This is great. Uh, three months. That's that is outstanding. So, yeah. is this covered by insurance? So, yes, most insurances cover palliative care services, um, and you know, there there is sometimes a distinction between the palliative care services and hospice services, and so that's why I say most of them cover it um, because that they, they sometimes have some different um, coverage uh, for for hospice services, um, but you know, pretty universally, uh, insurance companies will cover it. And one of the reasons is because it's holistic. It, it's looking at, you know, caring for the whole patient, looking at all of these different things and trying to connect them with appropriate resources and supports. Um, and, and, you know, as much as we can do to help keep people functional and help keep them out of the hospitals, um, the insurance companies really like that. Uh, so so they, they cover the palliative care services. 
And I, I'm gathering that there, there are really no bad questions uh, here. In other words, I can picture a, a lung cancer patient thinking, well, my legs hurt, but I don't want to bother my oncologist with it. But you could share that with a palliative care team. They might have some things that would make your life easier. Absolutely. Uh, and, and I always encourage our patients to do that. You know, we, we tell them that we partner and we're going to team with your oncologist, but we're here to talk about the things that maybe you feel you can't share with them or you're not ready to share with them or you didn't have time to, okay? Um, and, and so sometimes we, we just are a safe space. And it, it could be that, you know, they're discussing a change in treatment plan, but they didn't really understand what their oncologist or their radiation doctor um, explain to them. And so we have a chance to sit down and explore it a bit more, maybe talk to them about it um, and, and explain what does it mean for them? What does that look like? Um, and, and really just help ease their mind about what are the things that are being offered to them? And, and is it in line with what they want for themselves? And if you had a lung cancer patient, are there any special considerations that a lung cancer patient might um, come to you with? You know, whether it's coughing all the time or the stigma issue of the self-blame because I was a smoker or those types of things. Are, are those handled in palliative care as well? Absolutely. And, and those are really great points uh, for, for the different disease processes. We might focus on different things, but the common things that we see in lung cancer patients would be concern about their cough, sometimes chest pain. The other thing that we see is their fear of shortness of breath, their, their fear of air hunger. Uh, and so we do spend a lot of time talking to our lung cancer patients about how do we help manage shortness of breath or cough. Um, we also spend quite a bit of time helping with the stigma of smoking and, and you know, cancer patients with never smoking history. Um, sometimes they feel this guilt um, you know, associated with it because there's this long history of that association. Dr. Cervantes, how many patients use palliative care? Is it well known? Is it underused? Where are we with this? I think the most direct answer to that is it's underutilized. Um, I think that because of the association and stigma with hospice services, that people don't utilize the full extent of palliative care early enough. Uh, and so that's one of the big efforts of the palliative care field is to really help people understand, help educate both providers and patients and the community about what services are available. Um, you know, I can speak um, from, from our experience in our cancer center here. Uh, unfortunately, less than 1% of patients get referred to palliative care, and that's in any cancer group. Uh, and so you can imagine in, in, you know, cancers that maybe are less common, um, fewer people get referred. Um, I, I am a huge advocate for palliative care as, as an oncologist. Um, most of my patients get referred um, probably earlier than, than most. Um, but, you know, I, I think from, from the standpoint of understanding what it is and being able to educate the community, sessions like this are so vital and critical to helping people understand um, what, what we can do. You know, um, it, it really does help people live longer. It's fascinating. Are, are there areas that we didn't ask you about that you would like to share more about? I just think the value of palliative care um, is, is so um, misunderstood. You know, uh, I think most people only come across it or are introduced to it in an inpatient setting, um, very late in a disease illness course. Uh, and, and so we, we're not able to have the impact that, that we should be able to have on, on patients with lung cancer. And, and so when we talk about how many people are referred or, or how many people receive services, some of it's actually limited by the number of palliative care teams and the number of palliative care providers that are available uh, in that region. So, you know, I, I think if, if you have access to it, um, you know, utilize it. I, I can't stress enough how, how helpful it can be 
not just for, for patients, but also for their family members. We didn't really talk about the caregiver burden and the distress that, you know, loved ones and family members might experience as their, their family members going through cancer care. But that's another aspect of palliative care that we try and you know, dig into and, and, and try to help support so that the patient can feel better and, and get the best care. Dr. Cervantes, is excellent information. Thank you for, for sharing your expertise. We appreciate you today. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I love Dr. Cervantes' quote that palliative care is really supportive care. Palliative care is a team of medical experts providing added support that is available at any stage of illness. And you know, it's not only about the patient's comfort. Palliative care can help patients be successful in their lung cancer treatment. So now let's hear from someone who's actually experiencing palliative care. Sally Kane is living with stage four lung cancer and she is one of Dr. Cervantes' patients. Hi, Sally, it's so nice to meet you. I am very interested in your lung cancer story. Tell me about it. Um, it, uh, it just happened out of nowhere. Um, I just, I had an ache on my right side and um, this was uh, last May of uh, 2023, and uh, I got up the next day and uh, drove myself to the emergency room, um, and uh, they thought it was a kidney stone, and when none of the drugs helped that they gave me, um, they did a um, CAT scan of my lung, and then uh, the doctor came in and told me what they had found. And they did a bronchoscopy um, where they go down through the trachea and into the lung, into both lungs. And uh, after that was over, um, Dr. Hines uh, came and told my family uh, that I had stage four lung cancer and uh, it had metastasized to my spine and to my brain, and that um, uh, didn't have, I didn't have a very long to live. My team of doctors, uh, and one of them being Dr. Cervantes uh, in palliative care, have just been uh, an amazing support. And uh, I can't imagine going through this uh, without uh, my monthly meetings uh, with uh, Dr. Cervantes and her nurses. Yeah. Uh, they're excellent. And, uh, and it's not, um, it's not that you're giving up. Uh, I think my, my husband was diagnosed with gastric cancer and he, um, he did not have palliative care for the last seven months that he was alive. And it just, um, I'm so sorry that we didn't have it. We should have. Uh, but things move so quickly. Um, but my daughter really encouraged me about this. And certainly Dr. Taverna, you know, hooked me right up. And so uh, I'm just eternally grateful for all the things that they do and have done and helped me with through this journey. That's fantastic. The, a lot of people don't exactly know what palliative care is. And the, sometimes they can confuse it with hospice care. Yes, Yes. Tell me why you chose to go this route. What was it about palliative care that appealed to you? Well, um, I, it, it was explained to me uh, by my medical daughter. Um, she said, Mom, this is where you go for every other little thing that's bothering you because Dr. Taverna is just looking at your cancer and the lung and the, the base of the brain and on the spine the pulmonologist, Dr. Habib, is just looking at the lungs. Uh, Dr. Oshiri is just uh, concentrating on heart and cancer and muscle mass. And um, and then I go for IV infusions uh, for Fosamax to strengthen my spine. And this palliative care, you go for all the other symptoms and ailments that you have that are not related to any of those other doctors on the team. And, oh, it's just been, it's been wonderful. And I can give you a couple of examples. Mm -hmm. um, Great. The, um, 
uh, I had a horror, uh, I had a really bad call during Christmas and uh, my back started hurting and it sort of felt like every time I coughed, it felt sort of like the pain, like on my side when they first diagnosed me with um, lung cancer. And I didn't tell anybody, um, but then I had an appointment uh, with the palliative care team and uh, I told them about this because they noticed that I was coughing quite a bit. And um, they, uh, I said, well, I'm supposed to have a PET scan in about six weeks, a month to six weeks. And they said, why would we wait for that? You're worried. And I said, yes, I'm worried. Yeah. Uh, I'm terrified. Uh, she said, we're going to go right downstairs and have um, an x-ray of your lungs. We're going to check if they're inflamed. And um, maybe this is just muscular, which it, which that's what it was. Uh, so that that alleviated that fear because um, I really didn't know, I mean, I just, I didn't know who else to turn to, because I know Dr. Taverna is very busy in research four days a week and uh, clinic on Fridays, but, um, but this was something that I just kept to myself because I, uh, I didn't want to go there. <laughs> I don't know how else to explain it. Um, uh, I didn't want to think that the cancer had spread, um, but, um, uh, and then uh, there was another time uh, I had real problems with my right ear and uh, I collapsed um, when I was uh, at uh, physical therapy. That's another uh, referral that I got from palliative care because I'm a bit wobbly. I've lost about 30 pounds and um, I've lost a lot of muscle mass. And so when I went for the evaluation several weeks ago, um, I lost my equilibrium and and uh, collapsed. And uh, so palliative care, they hooked me up with an ENT who will eventually send me to an audiologist, I would think, to check my hearing. But Dr. Cervantes said that uh, possibly uh, when they did the radiation on the at the base of my brain, that uh, sometimes that that messes up the eustachian tube. So... Um, so that made me feel a little better because because um, there's something going on in there. <laughs> I don't know what it is, a pulsing or a rush or a wave, listening to waves or whatever. So these are things that I could talk to palliative care about that I wouldn't know who else to talk to. So uh, they've been a great help. It seems to me that what you're talking about is that these people kind of surrounded you with support and gave you the opportunity to talk about the other issues that maybe you wouldn't have talked to your doctor about because you're thinking it's it's not the same thing that they're interested in, they're too busy, whatever. Is that true? Is that what you would tell a patient? Yes, yes, I, I would, because um, some of the meetings with Dr. Taverner are about 30 minutes, but with palliative care, you have an hour, up to an hour and a half, sometimes two hours. Yeah. And um, the, uh, the, you know, I had an issue with my with my nails, um, Tegreso, this immunotherapy drug I'm on, apparently um, uh, does something to your nails and they split all the way down to the quick. And it's not, I mean, it's a small price to pay uh, for being on a drug that kills active uh, cancer cells and certainly takes the inflammation away from the main um uh, from the main mass and the spot on the base of my brain has gone from four millimeters to two millimeters, you know, but, um, but palliative care has made a difference in my life. Uh, and I just, I'm just so sorry that my husband didn't have that support yeah. because the team, it's, you know, it's all of them, the oncologist, the uh, palliative care, Dr. Cervantes, Dr. Habib, my pulmonologist, because I had to have another bronchoscopy because they were afraid that I had pneumonitis. And if that was the case, I'd have to get off of to Griso. So I, I worried about that. And then Dr. Ocheri um, has just done a workup on my heart. And we uh, visited with the um, orthopedic because I have a cracked rib also in that same area where 
they found the original cancer and uh, there were Dr. Taverna thought maybe they needed to put cement there and they decided not to because it's not hurting uh, as long as I don't pick up heavy things and uh, make it worse. So um, I just, I, I'm pleased that my daughter encouraged me to, to do palliative care. I just feel like there's hope. So maybe I'll get to see my granddaughter have her fifth mm -hmm. birthday party or, you know, um, but, and, and, and that's, you know, I, I've had a lot of support from my daughter and son-in-law and, um, and from my uh, church, uh, they just, uh, uh, Father David came to see me uh, in Austin uh, right before I had the bronchoscopy and then got the diagnosis. And uh, the, you know, support is, it's, it's a lot and you need it. And I can't imagine people going through this without support, but the palliative care team has just, has been, uh, just uh, miraculous. I, I mean, because it was a nightmare uh, when they when they tell you that you have lung cancer, you know. And I look at them and go, I never smoked a cigarette ever in my life. Uh, and where did this come from? So it's environmental. As we we hear from so many people, you know, yeah. if you've got lungs, you could get lung cancer. Lung cancer. It can happen to anyone at any time. Right. You make an yeah. excellent point, though is you're living with lung cancer and you your knee hurts or you've got an earache or your nails are splitting. Well, your family, while supportive, doesn't really know what to do. You feel kind of bad bothering your oncologist about it. Well, here's where the palliative team comes into play. In. Absolutely. There may be something to it. And if nothing else, it offers a higher quality of life. They can you know, kind of soothe some of those things over. So if someone out there is considering palliative care- Oh, absolutely. You'd say, yes, I, I oh. did. Yeah. And, and for a, their first consultation, what happens? What, what's kind of the exchange? What do they ask you? Well, it's a long consultation. They, they uh, You have to fill out a form of everything that's bothering you physically and mentally. Um, and uh, it takes it takes a long time uh, because they're just meeting you for the first time and they're getting to know you. And uh, uh, um, it's uh, it's not easy. It's not easy talking about it to strangers. Yeah. Uh, I'll say that. And and I think I probably cried the first time I was there because it just uh, all of that just kind of brought back my husband's situation and and losing him because we were so close. And uh, but you know they handed me a tissue and we moved on. And that's what I needed. I needed them to say, okay, how do you feel? And what's been happening? You've lost weight. You've lost appetite. Uh, you know, your fingertips hurt. I, you know, it's a crazy things like that. But, but, uh, but they, you know, are you dealing with financial issues? Um, do you have support at home? Um, do you have groups that, you know, that you, I used to belong to an exercise group. And um, I talked to the director. She came over to see me and she said, I just don't feel comfortable having you do what you normally did five years ago. And I appreciated that. So now I'm in physical therapy. So uh, and uh, that palliative care took care of that. And I have 11 sessions coming up. So but that first meeting, um, it's long and uh, bring your family uh, have your family members with you so they can hear you tell them how you feel because they need to know how you feel. You know how they feel. They're sad um, and upset and because it doesn't make sense because you look healthy, but you're not. And, um, and they need to remember that. Um, uh, and, uh, so the, the first session is tough, but after that, you'll get to know all the nurses and Dr. Cervantes and all of the different nurses, and they're wonderful. Um, so I just um, cannot stress the importance of having palliative care. Um, 
somebody in the palliative care team to help you through this. Um, and it's not right. hospice. No, it's not. I want to ask you about that. So my, I have one question. The first question is, how often do you see them? And then how do you see it as being very different from hospice? Uh, I see them about every six weeks. If I'm having a good spell, maybe maybe a little longer. Um, but uh, but I check in with them about that long. And so I know to get there an hour early so I can find a parking space. And, uh, you know, I finally figured out exactly where I am and where I'm going in this maze of a building. Yeah. Um, hospice is completely different. They uh, they take over. Right. Uh, that's that's their job. And uh, they bring in a bed and they bring in. Uh, people to bathe you and um, uh, they bring an ambulance to take you to your doctor's appointments. Um, they're there to administer medicine or IVs. Bob was on IVs a lot. And uh, uh, it's a, it's, it's not the same. Uh, it's not, you're not talking to a therapist. You're talking to a nurse that comes in to take care of you physically and it's not a it's not a mental i mean it it is it's when you're on heavy narcotics for pain yeah. it's um it's a, a supportive for the person who's taking care of uh, like it was supportive for me taking care of my husband that someone was there administering that medicine right. but palliative care is not that way you know they all have smiles on their face and they're you know, how are we doing today? And um, it's just kind of a breath of fresh air. And yeah. and I think that is, uh, that says a lot um, through good times and bad times. I mean, you need, you, you need that, um, that uh, uplifting support. You're a person too. I mean, you're not just a cancer victim. You're, uh, you know, I'm Sally. <laughs> <laughs> You're living with lung cancer, which is a wonderful thing to be living yes, with lung yes. cancer. You know, my birthday is 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 this month on the seventeenth. I'll be seventy. Happy and birthday! So, yes, yeah. thank you. So it's great advice for someone out there uh, trying to uh, contemplating and, and just trying to figure out if palliative care is something for them. Right. Just just have the best team care as you possibly can, uh, because that makes you feel like there's hope and that's what you want is hope um, to go on the next day. But thank you for giving me this opportunity. I appreciate it. Uh, and, and I just uh, hope and pray that anybody who has lung cancer, that their journey is as positive as mine has been due to palliative care. Good job. That's lovely. Fantastic yeah. job. <laughs> yes. What struck me most during our conversations was that only about 1% of lung cancer patients are taking advantage of palliative care. And, you know, we learned it can make such a difference during their lung cancer journey. Absolutely. Most insurance plans cover it, and it is designed to provide comfort and relief for the patient. So for many living with lung cancer, palliative care is really worthy of exploring. It really is. And if you're enjoying our Hope With Answers Living With Lung Cancer podcast, I hope you'll consider making a donation to help LCFA produce more of these types of resources. And remember, this podcast is a resource for patients or anyone seeking answers, seeking hope and access to updated treatment information, scientific investigation, and information about clinical trials. Make sure to subscribe to the Hope With Answers Living With Lung Cancer podcast. You'll be notified every time a new episode is available. So visit us online at lcfamerica.org where you can find more information about the latest in lung cancer research, new treatments, and more. You can also join the conversation with LCFA on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram.